So I like grape juice. Um, this is some grape juice uh, that I've had for um, about a week, or for the better part of a week, maybe maybe five or six days. And it's been really hot, like 80s, 90 degrees. Um, a lot of times I tend not to refrigerate things because I like things room temperature. But anyway, I yesterday this was still just after you know four or five days. It was still just looked like grape juice. By this morning, last night maybe or this morning, there were like a few bubbles, and then by this morning, there were a few more bubbles. A light a very light surface of bubbles but the pressure the pressure on the bottle was full so you know I relieved the pressure so after several days of being closed a great deal of pressure and a few bubbles were created then several hours later now a few moments ago I released the pressure again because once again it was very full and the bubbles had more than doubled and the smell now is very strong alcohol like this is the point where if I let it go further it will become vinegar it's about the strongest smelling wine I've ever smelt but then there's this beautiful, beautiful bubbly surface. And I don't know enough about it. I know there are scientists, cooks, I know there's a lot of people who would know exactly what's going on here. I don't. But it's pretty interesting, and what's interesting about it too is that it's from a a, past, a store bought pasteurized product that has been introduced to the local yeasts in my own environment, and has created essentially this really really beautiful product. And I don't know enough about wine or beer making. Um, which I, I've heard are quite different, but then what about groups and so on? Like there's all kinds of different fermentations. Um, but exactly, you know, what is this film? And is it beneficial? Is it detrimental to the health of the body? I would think that in, you know, older times, um, this part of the product would have been consumed. And what benefit does that have on the gut? Never mind, you know, I've heard that the Egyptian beers, you know, as far as the Egyptian uh, quote-unquote technology that um, people give reverence to, I've heard that much of uh, <clears throat> their fermentations weren't actually alcoholic, or, or barely alcoholic. Some of their beers and alcoholic brews were only slightly alcoholic. So the benefit incurred from the ingestion of the things that they made um, came from something uh, um, and, and the alcohol was kind of a, by pro, uh, a very small byproduct of the process. This also relates to a lot of like what um, Ter uh, Terence McKenna talked about in um, his book, I think it was Food of the Gods, where, 
you know, certain processes of, of mixing certain things together uh, eventually led to certain substitutions and so on, where all of a sudden you have something completely different than what was the original product and like the whole point. Um, so, and, and I'm not saying it's the case with this, but like, is the whole purpose is the whole purpose alcohol? Or are these bubbles? Is this particular microbiota? Is this particular primordial or postmordial soup of a panoply of life? The importance the import that which is to be ingested imported I mean and I'm and again I don't it, it's it's a metaphor that I'm speaking of you know the chicken and the egg like is this the important part or is this the important part or if we distill it further if we distill this further, we get pure alcohol. If we distill, refine, grow this further, what do we get? I don't know. Never mind the idea that the blue fruits... The blue fruits are said to hold the most amount of the monotonic gold. That's what they say. What if gold is fool's gold? What if iron pyrite is real gold? It's just a question. So, standing back to look at it, what do we have? And who among us can really answer that question? I can't. It's one of those things about life, about food. I mean, everything relates to everything, but like alcohol, ferments, bubbles. matrices, films, skin, cells. If you can't speak to root two, you can't speak to reason. <laughs> and if you can't speak to something so simple, which is not simple, which is rich. But if you can't speak to what happens to grape juice on a hot week, can you speak to truth? I say no. Can I speak to truth? No. Those who can speak to truth, speak to truth. And those who can't, seek or lie, or seek and lie. That's it. So I pour it off the strong line. Super duper effervescent. And once again, for me the question is how much of this is carbon dioxide and how much of this might be peroxides? Never mind nitrogen and other gases. 
and while I'm on the subject of bubbles and beers, which might seem just like a drunkard's foolish game, but in the legend of uh, King Arthur, or no, Robin Hood, uh, Friar Tuck, and his uh, development of mead. But then that goes back to the question of honey. Honey which we associate with bees, but then there's the legend of the honey without bees. Which, to my mind, could be one of two things. Uh, one, there is a species of moth that lives in trees, much like bees do, who secrete, produce a honey-like substance. And also, uh, the flowers of milkweed, but you must separate the flowers completely at the exactly right time, and I found this not by searching online, but I smelled a beautiful scent. I sought it out. It was like lilac times lilac. As it so happened, it was a milkweed flower that I serendipitously came upon to at the right time and picked just the flower parts put soaked in uh, maple syrup and after a day at the right temperature it tasted exactly like honey and honey and maple syrup though both sweet taste quite different if I let it sit longer which I did I made different batches but um then it became extremely sour and if I included more than just the flour it became very swampy because the rest of milkweed fermented is incredibly swampy but just the flour whew, beautiful anyway um. So now the bubbles have dissipated. And uh, what I was trying to get to with that was uh, to say that the most consistent bubbles I ever saw in any type of brew was Allagash. I don't know anything about Allagash except for that it's expensive for, a, you know, for a beer. And uh, when I pour it into a glass, its bubbles are all, they seem, they look perfectly consistent. So what's up with that? Never mind, um, I understand, you know, Guinness and all that and the nitrogen thing. Um, and those are incredibly fine and they have the whole appearance of, uh, if you have the right shaped glass, uh, of falling down, which is just the appearance of the outside layer but um, anyway I think that the interest in this type of thing uh, despite the fact you know that you can just be a stupid drunk but even a stupid drunk um, can contemplate the truth and if you are one, I suggest you do. <laughs> and if I am one, I suggest I do. <laughs> um, but it goes back to like the the idea of of life and of physics, of knowledge, of ingestion, and of tying everything together. And I think, for me, that's the interest of what's, what's really happening.
what's really happening with all these things. Why do these bubbles seem to magnetize in a certain way? Why do these bubbles do something that bubbles and other brews don't when it's some kind of life built in my apartment? Why do they react differently? Why does this film mimic a skin? Why do they stick together in some kind of way? See here, they come apart, but they come back together. Why is there this elasticity in this form? Why does it curl to a point? What's really going on? It's like the whole idea of like photons and bio photons and neurons and you know a photon and a bio photon biophysics you know cosmology interdisciplinarianism unitarianism and I don't mean that necessarily in the unitary church type of way but maybe they don't have such a bad thing going except for the whole conception of a metaphoric monism what would that even mean what would a metaf metaphoric monist be <laughs> how could you metaphorize one So now I've um, drank some of this ferment. It is quite delicious. Um, it doesn't taste quite so strong as it smelled. Very pleasant and uh, drinking it though in the ferment the bubbles looked quite large. Uh, drinking it they were the, the effervescence was quite fine, quite fine. But again, the remnants of effervescence are very fine and also by their dissipation we see that the film was really mostly like bubbles, like most of the actual what looked like matter has dissipated. And we see it really is mostly like bubbles and some kind of surface tension. And uh, it's quite strange. And this is kind of what I was trying to get to in some of my other fermentation videos. But like, what is happening with these bubbles? Like, there's obviously some sort of like, God, I hate to say it because I sound like a wacko nut who doesn't know what he's talking about. And by the way, I am. <laughs> but it, it appears like, it appears like there's some kind of like, electromagnetic thing going on like this does not behave like things that we're accustomed to this behaves this doesn't you know things I buy in the store don't behave this way not even kombucha you know and again this is just a store-bought product fermented during a hot week in my apartment. But anyway, uh, there's still latent bubbles. Latent, I don't know if that's the right word, but underneath. So I'm gonna give it a stir. And they, they rise. Give it another stir. They rise. And fall.
then they go away. But even in this very small amount, there's still all this gas. It's almost like a hypersaturated gas. I only say that because there's only this much liquid left, and when it sits, it like goes back to nothing. Or almost nothing. But again, these, yeah, these continents of bubbles. And then the strong, strong, the strong shape around the perimeter. Like, what is going on with that? Yeah, like that, that thing that just happened. Over here. Like, there's this, you know, how much is surface tension? How much is some kind of electrodynamic thing? It's so beautiful. Look at all these little galaxies of yeah, the way that just shaped it, that the way that shape the way that shape curls right there, like I don't know. And then poof, gone. But what remains? So interesting. And not to say even that this is matters, this is good, that, that, that you should drink something like this. I mean, I've been drinking it, I like it. And if you're going to drink booze, I don't know, drinking like something like this is just as good as anything else, but... Everywhere is an object of study. And where we find interesting pieces of life we can't explain... That's, in some sense, that's where we find the heart of the matter. And if we look for it, then it will find us where we meet our own lives. The, the truth, you know, looking for the truth is something we do in our mind not always in the outside world we can't help but being in our mind and we can't help but being in the outside world but if we look for the truth in our mind it will find us in the outside world wherever we are and you know this was an act of negligence on my part and to my mind it has given me it has produced a fruit that has been far more um, elucidating than many of the things that I have tried to do on purpose. And that is very often the case. Not that we shouldn't try to do things on purpose. It's just... Sometimes when we try to do things on purpose, we fail. But the intent we, be, we put behind trying to do that thing on purpose that fails, in my mind, is the very, like we put intent into doing something. We do that something and we fail. But that intent that we put into doing something that fails is what informs the world to put pieces together in the world, in our world, to achieve accidentally or occidentally
the effect that our intent intended. I probably have that grammar wrong, but I'm close on it. Like, we try to do shit and we fail. We try to do shit and we fail. And then all of a sudden, something we didn't try to do comes to us that relates to the thing we were trying to do. And what I'm saying is, it's that intent behind the things that we fail at that informs the accidents that happen in our lives to create the success we were looking for by what we attempted and failed at. But we intended and succeeded, just not the way we thought we would. Pour it out and say it's finished, but it ain't finished. Not yet.